Hi everyone, my name is Hi. Melissa. Uh, I'm thrilled to be here tonight. Hi Grandma and Grandpa. Happy you are here. And yeah, let's get this going, Steve. Tonight I want to tell you the story of how I went from this photo to that photo. Last November I spent 10 days in the hospital. I was diagnosed with a rare illness called rhabdomyolysis, or rhabdo. It was one of the most terrifying experiences of my life. In the months prior to rhabdo, I was doing as well as I had ever been doing in my life. I practiced healing past traumas, hiked Montana, yoga every day, and prepared for what would be a transformative life experience to come in Arusha, Tanzania. In Arusha, I taught English to little kids, I learned Kiswahili, and trekked Mount Meru, the second highest peak in Tanzania. I was finally living the life I had always wanted to live. That's Kilimanjaro in that picture on the right. It was at that juncture that this surprise illness, rhabdo, manifested itself in my body. Five days after returning to Montana from East Africa for what I had planned to be a stay just long enough to swap out my malaria pills for my sun hat, gearing up for a Guatemalan transition, I became ill with rhabdo. Rhabdomyolysis causes healthy skeletal muscles to spontaneously disintegrate inside your body. The attending ER doctor diagnosed my condition as rhabdo very quickly, and he notified me that a dangerous complication is renal failure. When the body's muscles, which are breaking down impossibly fast, flood the system with toxins, the kidneys are unable to filter everything, and they can become overwhelmed. A blood marker of rhabdo is an elevated CK level, a muscle enzyme. A typical person's CK level is around 200. Upon arriving in the ER, my CK level read 100,000, and it continued to rise. The ER doc said, for a person of your stature, Melissa, hear me when I say this is an impressive number. <laughs> As I sunk in to my new bed and body in the hospital, I was a mess. My muscles radiated heat and felt as though I had raked a steel tooth comb through them, tearing apart the muscle fibers. I also had a cough, a pulsing headache, and my urine was frighteningly the color of Hawaiian fruit punch. As my body continued to break down over the next 10 days, I lost most of my mobility. I couldn't stand upright, I couldn't walk, I couldn't use my right arm, and I couldn't sit up on my own. The long and the short, I was completely incapacitated, and I was so scared. The most common cause of rhabdo is physical overexertion, like cases resulting from spin class or CrossFit, Neurology, rheumatology, infectious disease all came to visit me and they had questions and they had tests. And in the end, my brand of rhabdo had no known cause. 10 days in a hospital bed required me to lean on others, quite literally. Gratitude doesn't begin to cover my feelings for all of my someones. I had optimists and realists, criers and laughers, feeders and peers. They took care of me absolutely. Thank you, Mom, Dad, Kiana, Cammie, friends, and Robert. I remember the exact moment Robert walked into my hospital room. He fed me applesauce, he created laughter, he soothed me while I wept, and he wore his own set of pajama scrubs for the duration. He so gracefully held my hand that not once did I feel embarrassed or defeated or alone. Being on an IV drip 24-7 means you have to pee a lot. For the nightly excursions to the bathroom at 2 a.m. and 3 a.m. and 4, I would ring this cowbell to wake Robert. He usually woke up, but one night, the nurses rushed into the ringing as Robert slept as peacefully as I had ever seen him sleep. <laughs> I also missed koi. By day six, the muscles in my throat were so disintegrated that I lost what are called pressure consonants. Think D's and T's. So when I told everyone that I wanted to see my dog, all they could hear was my asking for my nog. After seven days without improvement, I could only withstand so much more pain and breakage without a solution. I wondered what it would mean if my body was broken forever, or if I died. In this uncertainty and powerlessness, I wept in fear. As I sat in this feeling, eventually I remembered Pema Chodron's words. Things falling apart is a kind of testing and also a kind of healing. 
We think that the point is to pass the test or to overcome the problem. But the truth is that things don't really get solved. They come apart, they, I'm sorry, they come together and they fall apart. The healing comes from their letting there be room for all of this to happen. When things in my life fall apart, I assume that something is wrong. But the reality is, it isn't. The paradox is that to heal is to lean into the falling apart. At that point, I turn to this mantra. It's like this now, knowing that it'll be like something else soon. It's like this now. No one knows how or why I got rhabdomyolysis, but I know that our bodies communicate with us. The physical body keeps an account of our spiritual, mental, and emotional bodies. What was my body saying to me? What is my body continuing to say to me? Those are the questions I seek to answer now. After 10 days, my symptoms receded and I was released from the hospital. My kidneys had weathered the stress and I could only hobble with a walker. Three months later, I was able to move my body into Picasana or crow pose. And I know that it's like this now, and it'll soon change in some way. Seven months after my illness, I returned to the African continent, to South Africa this time, and completed a Vipassana meditation course where I learned a 2,500-year-old meditation technique. There, I considered and released thoughts like, what suffering have I experienced? What's the meaning of it? Which turned me inward to my experience with rhabdomyolysis. Something I learned at the Vipassana course is a concept known as a Nietzsche, or impermanence. Being able to practice the acceptance that things are as they are, and that they will change. From a Nietzsche, to things coming together and falling apart, to rhabdo or rhabdon, what I do know is that it's like this now. Thank you.